Um, all right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, so great to have so many of you joining us on this really, really special night. Happy International Women's Day. Um, I hope you found your own special way of celebrating um, this day and all of the women in our lives and um, all the contributions women have made to make um, this world a better place. So shout out to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this night um, is a really special night that was put together um, by Jossie Lee. Jossie, if you could wave. I see the slide is up, so I'm not sure if everyone can see you. And also Vicki Grisanti, can you like just give a wave so everyone sees who you are? Um, I wanna thank you so much for uh, the birth of this idea and for actually making it happen um, and for bringing Sophie or Sophia on board. Sophie, if you could just give a wave too so everyone can find you. Um, and also Kayla, Kayla, can you wave and so we can give you a little shout out to, um, you're going to see and hear more from Kayla and Sophie um, in a moment, but just as we're getting started, um, I would love it if you could take a moment to think about your most creative moment. Or if you're in a moment of creativity, what does it feel like? And what are you doing? So I'm inviting you to um, take about 30 seconds to think about that. When you are in that zone of creativity, what are you doing and what does it feel like? And enter that into the chat after um, you've had a moment to think. I'm gonna restate the prompt and then read some of the responses. Please keep them coming. So when you're in your creative zone or mode or feeling creative, what do you feel like and what are you doing? Flow state, very calm, making something with my hands or making connections with people. Usually I'm in art class and I feel happy and excited. I'm using paint, allowing it to go wherever. It's fun. I feel like I'm in charge of everything and that I can do anything. I feel empowered. Being creative makes me feel calm. I feel thriving. My mind is filled with ideas, happy. When I'm writing, I can create whatever I want with wonder, with words, sorry. For me, words are the medium. When I'm in that place that you describe, I feel as if I'm changing the characters in the story. That's thrilling. Building a fort and it feels fun to problem solve. When I am listening to music, daydreaming, in my heart and body, not my head, working. It feels like I'm able to do more versatile things. Excited, engaged, determined, and successful. I don't know. <laughs> I feel focused and in the zone, immersive while building. I it feels like I am in my own world, thriving through happy thoughts, 
and creating new ideas when I'm being creative. I feel productive and like I can get things done. Mm. What beautiful and powerful words and messages. Thank you for sharing all of those. Um, feel free to keep them coming throughout the evening. And um, as part of the closing, I can read any additional ones. Um, I want to not take up too much more of the evening um, with my voice because we have a couple of other really important and exciting voices to hear tonight. Um, I want to introduce you to um, Sophie or Sophia Cressy, um, who will be interviewed by Kayla. I want to make sure I get Kayla's last name correctly. Vallecillo? Um, Kayla, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I should have asked you that before we got started. Um, so please correct that. Um, Kayla, who's doing the interviewing this evening, um, is a prospective um, New England Innovation Academy student. Um, she would be attending eighth grade. Um, she's an aspiring astrophysicist, amazing student who's on student council, and we are so happy um, that she's able to join us this evening. So um, Kayla, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, to allow us to get to know Sophie better and learn from her this evening. So my name's Kayla and I'm in eighth grade. And right now I'm like really inspired by Sophie, especially because she's an astrophysicist. And that's like my dream. Um, I love building and learning, especially about the universe, so like space is my passion, and I think that's what Sophie and I have in common. We both love space and learning about the universe. I guess I'll say a little something about myself. Um, so I'm Sophie. Um, let's see. I'm, how old am I? I'm 23, so I have a few years on Kayla. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm currently a PhD student at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So this is when Zoom does come in handy because I can talk to all of you guys in Boston or you know in the surrounding New England area. Um, and just a little bit about me is um, I grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Um, I went to Boston University for undergrad, so I didn't go far at all. Um, and uh, from there, I studied astrophysics and painting and got two uh, degrees. Um, and we can talk about that more later. And then after that, I went and interned at NASA for a few months um, and got to work on the Artemis program. Um, and then uh, after that, I attended, I started grad school. And here I am. I'm in my first year and I'm, yeah, second semester. It's going pretty well. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's all about me. And so now I think I have a good context of where I'm coming from. Oh, I'm also from Massachusetts. I, I live in Upton. All right, Kayla, are you ready to begin your interview? Yes. So okay. Um, we came up with a few questions, and our first one is, how do you balance art and astrophysics? All right, well, that's, <laughs> I could talk about this forever, because I tried managing that for four years in undergrad. Um, I think the perfect way to explain it um, is, so in high school, it was very manageable, because I had art class, and I had physics class, and, you know, you were just kind of having fun in both. Um, when you go to undergrad, um, there is, you know, significant more time constraints on how much time people want you to spend on physics or astronomy and uh, painting. And so uh, the, I guess the perfect analogy was, uh, is like from Harry Potter when Hermione Granger is, uh, wants to take two classes and she has to use the, I forget what it's called, but she has to turn back time basically to attend her class. That's what I kind of had to do. I um, had schedule, I would constantly have classes scheduled at the same time because why would the like art department ske uh, schedule uh, with the physics department to make sure that things don't conflict you know why they don't talk to each other um, and so it was a lot of running up and down Commonwealth Ave um, I kid you not I was running like up until senior year um, and so that took 
a fair amount of time of figuring out how to manage stuff. Um, it was very easy to feel like uh, because I wasn't spending my entire time on astrophysics or my entire time on painting that I was a lesser student in either of them. And I struggled with that for like a really long time, basically until senior year when I got my degrees and I was like, oh, okay, I did it. Um, but um, yeah, so it was just about trying to, you know, complete your assignments, right? But also I realized since being in grad school, um, you kind of need both. And I think this goes for a lot of STEM majors. You need something to balance the like heavy duty load of STEM. And so a lot of STEM majors have like music or theater or dance and mimes have to be painting. Um, and so I think this, this will end up being a theme I think throughout uh, like this talk is that balance is very important uh, when you're trying to do anything. And so I, by the end of the undergrad, it felt like I needed art in order to do well in physics. I need physics in order to do art well. They had, they kind of go hand in hand and like who I am, you know? So basically what I'm saying is don't give up on your hobbies and don't give up on like art or like, you know, your little thing, passions, because they all end up lending hands, I think, to each other in the end. I find it so inspiring that you were able to like blend two things together and like express your creativity through something so much like different. <laughs> um, so our next question was, what memory stands out from your time at NASA and why? Ooh, memory. Um, well, so my time at NASA was very interesting because it uh, the pandemic started right in the middle. So I would say things, yeah. you know, um, things are a little different than an average internship, but I think, um, oh man, there were so many moments I have to say, <laughs> but <laughs> let's see. One of my favorite moments was, um, I went to a, I think it was actually almost a year ago today. Um, I went to uh, the, NASA had a Women's International Day uh, talk where they had at, like astronauts, like important ma female managers on stage and they got to talk about their experiences and what it's like to be in STEM and especially NASA as a woman. And one of the astronauts is uh, Suni Williams. And she was talking and the first thing she said was, hi, I'm Suni Williams. Like, I'm from Boston, like I'm from outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And like uh, someone asked her a question, like what was the hardest thing like coming to NASA? And she was like, or no, she, sorry. She ended up saying, I I'm from outside of Boston. I talk really fast and I swear a lot. So that's where we're gonna <laughs> have a little issue here. Um, and, I, and I got to talk to her afterwards. And um, as Kayla will see, astronauts are very approachable and they're very kind people. And she basically was like, let's go get Duncan <laughs> at some point. <laughs> of course we couldn't because of the pandemic, but <laughs> it was just like an astonishing moment to like meet someone who was like basically an idol who lived in my backyard and felt about like acted the same way as me, you know, all these little like niche things that are so unique to New England and is in my like, you know, dream goal or like dream job. And so that was like pretty incredible where you're just like making this like very real and personal connection with someone who's just so amazing. <laughs> that you must be feel, Kayla. <laughs> I think everyone has a little aspiration in them to meet someone like that high of like duty or like meeting in an astronaut to me is like in person. It's like meeting a God. It's like crazy. <laughs> So what surprised you most about NASA? Oh, let's see. Um, oh, there's a lot of things. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what is the, I would say, um, I mean, you're learning a lot about government work, right? You know, as fast as science moves, government, you know, kind of slows that down. Um, but I think, oh, I think the biggest thing about NASA was um, I was expecting, you know, more of a cutthroat environment because I'm like, this is my dream job. It's so hard to get this, it's so competitive. But really when you get there, they're just so accepting of like every part of you and they treat you like family immediately. And they're, and like, I remember my like boss's boss's boss had, he like sees all the interns for that branch and he sat me down and he was like, listen, like you got your foot in the door. There, you don't need to prove anything. Like we're just here to help you at this point and like uplift you essentially and support you. And that was like so strange coming from like an undergrad, like I love BU, but it felt strange coming from an undergrad where they're 
kind of pushing you down for a lot of it, trying to get you to like, you know, quit your degree. Um, yeah. Because, you know, they're like, physics is hard. Are you capable? Versus, <laughs> like you go to Ness and they're like, you made it. Have fun. Like you're part of the family now. And it was just like a, such a switch. Um, so, yeah, I mean, not that you don't already want to work for NASA, but it's already <laughs> another great benefit is that they are just like the kindest people that I've met so far, like on a job or in academic setting, like all of that. I think also you are like their perfect candidate too <laughs> so oh, you're perfect for the job <laughs> they're like engineers if anyone is looking at uh, nasa loves engineers and aerospace so there you go <laughs> <laughs> so our next question was um as an astrophysicist what motivates you to keep looking up and deciphering the universe well you know it doesn't take much it just you take a look at the stars <laughs> i would say that goes for most <laughs> astrophysicist um no I mean I think it's like when you're in class and you're learning about all these like very complicated topics and um you know slowly starts to make sense but your teachers end up arriving at this issue where they're like well we don't know what goes beyond this like xyz um like this is what we know but you know there's there's so much that is unknown and I think that's what's so thrilling is that it's not just like you have to go into like the most popular topic you can really choose like any niche of astronomy and go into that and you're gonna discover something. Um, and it's very independent. It's very like, um, it's all research obviously, but um, it's like going at your own pace and like discovering for yourself. You know, there isn't, there's collaboration, but it's very much like an independent work. And that is similar to painting, why I think I vi like, you know, vibe with <laughs> astrophysics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that, that's so true. I feel like there's so much left to explore and to discover. So it's like, whenever I even think about it, it's like, like I need to start now. Like I got to get started so I can find <laughs> out as much as I can. Yeah. Um, so our next question was, what advice would you give young girls and boys who aspire to become future innovators and scientists? Right. Um, so this kind of is like two things. Um, which goes into like imposter syndrome and yeah, and like just having confidence in yourself. Um, I mean, obviously Nia is going to be a very supportive place like, and my high school was too. And I think high school is like a great place to cultivate interests and, you know, establish that passion. But, mm -hmm. you know, like life isn't going to be this nice little bubble that, you know, supports you the whole way. And when I got to undergrad, I had a lot of people saying that, you know, you can't do this. And, um, and I, you know, and you look around you in your classroom and I see like a bunch of students who look a lot different than me, first of all, you know, there's not a whole lot of women in physics classes. Mm -hmm. And they also like, you know, they they fit the like stereotypical like physics student. <laughs> and, you know, not a whole lot of the physics students were painting majors as well. And so mm -hmm. I kind of got this idea in my head where I was like, okay, I don't look like them. So I must not be qualified or good enough. And um, that transcends like all careers. So regardless of what anyone does, but I think it's especially bad in physics um, because you know, the diversity is so lacking across the board. Um, yeah. And it's also just so hard. And you have a lot of physics professors who are like, this is hard. You may not be cut out for it. And that I like everyone that I've talked to in my grad program has had someone basically tell them, no, you can't do this. Um, so to all these aspiring kids who want, or students who want to do astrophysics, basically my advice is just to have complete faith in yourself and don't compare and um, basically make your own path and create your new, like basically create the new stereotype of a physicist or break it, you know, like don't, let other people's opinions of you define you um and because that almost like you know that almost made me drop out of the major it made plenty of my friends drop out of the major it's it's gets tough like there's a very uh, i would say <laughs> hard culture in physics that is slowly being chipped away by young like astrophysics and physicists in uh supporting people and not letting and like basically supporting everyone and including everyone in the conversation versus just like, you know, the smartest of the smartest. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned how you had 
like professors that were really cutthroat with you. Um, was there any like one moment where someone told you something that were, like really brought you down and how did like you overcome that? <laughs> well, <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> it would result in me uh, calling my father and crying down Commonwealth, <laughs> as you can attest. No, um, it was a lot of me being like, okay, that's nice that uh, you think that, but you know, I don't uh, believe, I don't believe anything that you're saying. I had one, one of my, uh, my advisor for uh, astronomy basically was like, your grades aren't good enough to go to grad school. And I was like, cool. <laughs> And then I left because I was like, I don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> like, I'm a junior, senior, like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give up now. Okay. Um, no, I think it's just like, people would just say this stuff. It was like, you know, obviously, there's the initial like feeling of like being crushed and just being like, why do people feel the need to just put other people down, especially when they're students who are just trying their hardest. But then there's like the after fact of like, there's a few things. There's the I'm going to just, I'm going to prove them wrong because now I'm angry and I'm going to prove them wrong and just be like, okay, well, like, you know, you were wrong. I'm going to go get a graduate degree and rub it in your face when I come back in four, you know, five yeah. years. There's that like vindicative thing, which is probably not the like <laughs> nicest solution. But then there's a lot of like afterwards, just like reflection and realizing that person doesn't know me <laughs> at all in the slightest. They're going off of a piece of paper that has my grades on it and at the end of the day that doesn't mean anything like you're great like that's not my grades aren't why I got to go to NASA it was because of my painting degree and I think the reason why I got into grad school was also like a combination of painting NASA and my research like grades at the end of the day are very ins is insignificant so um, yeah. takeaway is just like you have to first like obviously angst is a great thing but also having faith and confidence in yourself and also having like, you know, friends and family support you too, that tell you, you know, that awful person is wrong, <laughs> always helps, but yeah. And I'm like, I'm very sure that if you're in a position where people are telling you that you can't do something, that you can like always like reach out to people that have been through it before and they'll always help you with it. So it's like having support with people that you might not even like know, but people have been through what you've been through. It's like, it's really cool. Um, also, I think like, since there aren't many women in the physics field, like being pushed down or like brought down is like probably very common. So that needs to change. Yeah, it does. That's another reason uh, you gotta persevere. You're like, well, you know what? I'm just gonna take your job and uh, kick you out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the goal. <laughs> oh my gosh. Kayla and Sophie, you both are so inspiring. Um, Kayla, there's a question in the chat. Can you let me know when's a good time to share that question? It's a question for Sophie. I think now's a great time. <laughs> okay. This question comes from Rick Hardy. He asks, um, where, were there mentors that helped you during your time at BU? If so, how did you find them? That's a good question because, you know, mentors are extremely important um, uh, in any field, really. But um, so generally physics class, like physics students create their own little uh, clubs that you can mentor through. So I had a, there was like as a freshman, you get a like upper classman uh, mentor. Um, and uh, she was really instrumental in making me like continue physics. Cause I remember coming back with my like failing tests and she was like, no, that's normal. Like you're gonna get so many more of those. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and so she kind of like broke that reality of like you know perfect grades um so that was great but then I also had um a research professor so you know if, if anyone has like specific physics and astronomy qu questions later on I can also answer those too but I had a research mentor who was um really helpful he was very direct and so if something wasn't you know up to par he would very much tell me and so and as well as like, you know, give me instruction, like how to apply for grants, like how to apply to grad school, how to do all this stuff. And um, like, he was so important to getting me to grad school. Um, so research advisors are great. If you can make like a special connection with one, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, just, and also like, take advantage of people, of like professors, you know, they're there to like serve you essentially, you're paying for them to be there. Like, get as many, as much information and questions out of them. Um, 
But yeah, I would, I don't know if anyone knows Dan Clemens at BU. He's uh, currently the head of uh, <laughs> the astronomy department, but he was very supportive in um, getting me here. So yeah, mentors are important. I think having that support, it's like very special. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you um, um, he was really awesome and senior year of college, he, uh, flew me out to Flagstaff, Arizona to take observations on a telescope, the Lowell Observatory. And he just like did not need to do that at all. And um, that was really incredible. And also like gave me enough reason to be like, I want to do this forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, our next question was, what would you tell yourself, like tell your younger self if you could do that now? Similar to the younger, students like telling younger students where I guess for me specifically I would say just like don't listen to anyone around you like don't listen to any like <laughs> professor <laughs> getting you down you know expect like in art and physics because you know art critiques can be pretty nasty too um <laughs> I don't know if anyone's gone through art school but <laughs> those are pretty bad um but yeah basically don't listen to anyone just keep on chugging and like not like keep your head down and you know get it done but like just like trust yourself and trust your instinct and um, like just have faith in yourself. It's really hard as a young person to have faith in yourself because you're entering this world where everyone's telling you to do, you know, this, this, and this, and you have to do it this way or this way or this way. And so I think it's really hard when you're young and forging a new path. And so I would say if anyone wants to like, I guess now this is what I would tell myself, but also now I'm telling you, um, if you want to do something that's different than everyone else or get to a like get to a final destination in a different path or a different way, you just do it. Don't listen to what anyone like any hesitations, you should just do it or it, and or at least try it um, because you're gonna learn more and it's your way. It's gonna work out better for you anyways. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, I feel like when you find your passion, like persevering through it might be hard at moments, but like at, in the end, you're just like trying to get to where you want to be, like not where anyone else wants you to be. Exactly. It's like, that's <laughs> your, like also it's like, it's your path. It's your destination. You know, it's not someone else's now. So yeah. it's more like strength to keep going. Mm -hmm. I think we did have another question in the chat too. Yeah, there are two other questions. Shall I read them? Sure. <laughs> All right, here's one. Um, how did painting play a role in your school or job application success? Um, so usually painting is a hit or miss. <laughs> um, usually uh, you get, uh, in for job applications, it can be like someone, like for me, it was my NASA mentor. Uh, he is very much into music and he's a singer and, and he sings in the choir and he, so we connected on that like deeper level in like the artistic realm. So we like got along great. Um, but you know, like that's not, everyone's gonna see that and pick it up and be like, oh, you know. Um, so in job success, I think it's definitely like for some people it's a foot in the door and other times it's just like, why? I got a lot of like, I, I do know that like a lot of my astronomy advisors were like, kind of like, why do you need to be doing this? Like, this is, it seems like a waste of time. Like <laughs> you're just spending a ton of money on paint and then making kind of okay paintings, you know, but you know, it means a lot more than that. <laughs> um, in school success, um, uh, let's see, it was, I wouldn't say it necessarily, for me it was successful because like I got to do what I loved, but my grades did hurt a little bit more in physics because physics, you know, requires literally everything from you. Um, but you know, that doesn't matter. I don't care about my grades at all. <laughs> um, as long as you get B's or C's, like it's passing. Um, but <laughs> no, I, th I think in school that like, in terms of like success, it was like, I got to meet new people. I got to get new perspectives. Like I got everything out of college that I could possibly get out of it. And so like, I always tell people like, I got my bang for my buck because I got two degrees out of uh, <laughs> four and a half years. Um, but 
uh that yeah that's how I would say <laughs> okay here comes another one you're doing great thank you so much for no, no. <laughs> um were you really happy when you got the job in NASA if so why yes I uh <laughs> I cried for like literally I don't even know like two hours straight um <laughs> it was just like insane um I couldn't believe it because the jobs are just like they're hard to come by and um it was basically a confirmation that I was like you, you know you don't really you, this shouldn't be like the case but it is like it was basically just like confirmation that like I can do this like I can be an astronomer like someone has found value in my resume and my college experience and like who I am essentially and thinks that that's enough to like go do my dream job and like continue. And so if anything, like getting the NASA job has really just like solidified the fact that like, I'm like, this is gonna happen. And like, no matter what anyone says at this point, like I can just, I don't know, it's just, and like, I don't care what you say, like clearly I'm worth it to someone out there. <laughs> um, but I think it was also like, you know, it's every little girl's dream, I think to like work at NASA. like. How is it not? <laughs> um, so that was also like a, oh my God. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really just like the confirmation of like, I knew what I, like that the way, the path that I took was correct. And I, it, it ended up paying off, you know? Yeah. Also, I feel like right now is a perfect example that like you're inspiring a ton of other young girls and boys that want to do the exact same thing. So it's like, it's kind of like, I don't know, showing you that you can, you can set an example for what others can be. Well, I always promise, I was like, if I do make it, like, I will make sure that there are more, like, there's more diversity, like, more women, like, more everyone in astronomy, like, just more inclusive in astronomy and get as many people interested because, like, I wish I had a little bit more of that, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Hey, cool. Um, here's one more question, and then I think we will, um, so after this question, Kayla, I'll check back in with you to see if you have any others, and then mm -hmm. we'll move into a little talk about um, Mia. All right, here is the question. Um, what motivated you to choose the double major? How draw, how did draw, sorry, how drawing helped you in your study of space? How did drawing help you in your study of space? Um, so for the double major, um, it's actually kind of funny, um, until context, my whole family are artists. So my dad and my mom went to art school. Uh, three of my four grandparents went to art school. Um, it's just like part of who I was supposed to be <laughs> as an artist. As the firstborn <laughs> child of my family, I was supposed to be the artist. Um, and so like I grew up going to museums, you know, like my dad was, my grandfather was a painter. He had a studio, like it was always just like art. Art is what you're supposed to do. Art is the best thing. And I completely agree. Like, honestly, it's one of the best like forced upon professions anyone could possibly receive. Um, and so I knew going to college, I wanted to do art. Um, there's no way around that. Um, but then with the astronomy, you know, like I just was, I just loved being out. Basically we were, Kayla and you were talking about this. Both of our like, experiences with science kind of rooted with like being outside and then like asking why about like everything and so that kind of is what happened to me where I was like why does this happen why does this happen and then you know it turns into like okay why do like how do cells create themselves like how do they regenerate like or like how why does a frog jump like that you know where'd it come from and then it turns into like okay, well, like, why are the stars up there? Why is that star different from that one? And how far is that? And you start asking all these questions um, and you want answers, you know? Like, <laughs> that's why we're here to get answers. <laughs> um, and so that's, I, I just couldn't, for a while I entered BU and I was a double major and I was like, you know what, I'll drop one, you know, at some point I'll drop astronomy and physics and I'll, or I'll drop painting. One of them will become a minor and, you know, I'll figure it out. I just couldn't, it was too much fun, you know, like physics can stink sometimes, but uh, it, the astronomy is just so much fun and painting is so much fun. Like it just, for me, they're just so much fun. Yeah, I don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't give up on either of them. 
Um, and it's, I think it's also like the curiosity part of like, both of them have so many questions that you can ask and try and answer someday. And just my curiosity wouldn't let up. So I think that's why I had to stick with it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you did. Kayla, do you have any other questions? Not that I can think of right now. <laughs> well, you are a wonderful interviewer. You sparked so many of our participants to ask other questions. And we really got to know Sophie well through your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. So maybe your balance is journalism or interviewing and maybe. astrophysics. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about um, the Innovation Studio and how the curriculum will work at NIA. Um, then I'm going to introduce or ask um, NIA staff and faculty that are on this um, Zoom call to just wave and sort of show themselves. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions, comments, um, that kind of thing. And um, also um, there was another really interesting conversation that happened that I'll, I'll tell you about in a little bit. Uh, we'll see if time will allow for all of those things to happen this evening. Thanks everyone for hanging in there with us. This has been so um, interesting and engaging so far. Uh, so if you could take a look at the graphic that's on the screen right now, I wanna connect uh, this graphic that is about the innovation studio and how it um, really bonds together all these other parts of learning that are going to happen at NIA. I want to connect that to some of the things that Sophie said this evening um, that I just thought, oh my gosh, this is just so brilliant that she would make these statements as we're talking about innovation studio. So um, when Sophie was talking about these two majors that she had with these two different departments um, that weren't talking to each other, uh, she posed this question. She said, why would the art department schedule with the physics department? And I thought, oh my gosh, Sophie, such a good question. <laughs> so one of the reasons why you see these overlapping circles um, in this graphic about the curriculum is because we don't want students to go through that experience that Sophie went through. We do want the um, faculty to be talking with each other, planning with each other, and to have some overlap between one subject area and another. How amazing will it be for students who are trying to balance their art and their science work to have classes that have both things going on um, so that they can naturally um, bring those two passions together. So um, that will be the experience at NIA. Um, students may have, well, they will have some math work that's embedded in science, some science that's in math, um, looking at um, the human experience through numbers, all of those things will be happening. So there'll be um, lots of overlap. And you'll also see that there are some parts of the things that are being studied, well, whether it's the arts, the science, the math, humanities, the well being, that don't have any overlap at all, because sometimes you just need to talk about a technique in art, or you just want to talk about what you're going to express through your painting or your block print or your silk screen um, that might not necessarily be connected to some of the other things all the time. So both things will be happening. I heard um, Sophie say that um, there needs to be a balance of STEM and other subjects. So um, one of the things um, that we're aiming for here at NIA is that balance. So yes, there's time in innovation studio. Yes, there's time in science. Um, and there's also time studying and reading literature. There's also time working on mathematical literacy. There's also time understanding um, the histories of different people around the world and how their cultures impact us and how we impact them. So um, all of those other things will be happening. 
And my hope is that um, those passions will be so alive that um, there has to be a balance because you won't want to sacrifice one for the other. Um, and while certainly, as Sophie explained to us, some things will require more time at some times, and you'll have to do a little bit of shifting back and forth. Uh, my hope is that there'll be so much excitement about different things that, um, yeah, the, the balance will naturally happen. Um, I want to call attention to the time. It's almost 7.45. Um, I wonder if we can um, take the slides now just for a moment, oh, okay. because I would just like to see everyone's face. And I would really like for anyone that's on the NIA team um, to just maybe give a wave <laughs> or something, um, just so we can get a sense of your presence. Um, we have some a full range of folks that are on this call with us from people that are on the founding team to people that have just joined the team. Um, the head of school is on the call. So we've got a wide range of folks. I'm not sure how to um, give voice to everyone, um, but maybe through the last 15 minutes or so, um, if you um, maybe even put a uh, hand up on your screen, at least people can identify you. They can see your name. They can see that you're part of the NIA team. And um, also, if you could, sorry, I'm giving you all these assignments. <laughs> if you could rename yourself so that you put your role um, next to your name, if you're on the NIA team, um, that would really help people be able to um, see what you do. And if there's anybody that's got a specific question for you, um, they know that you're here to answer that question or that you can take up that, that question a little bit later. So that was a lot, I'll say that again. <laughs> if you're on the NIA team, so your staff, faculty, or on the founding, part of the founding crew, <laughs> um, if you could rename yourself, you, know, you go um, on your Zoom box in the upper right-hand corner where those three little dots are. If you could rename yourself to include what your role is on the team. And if you could also um, put a little hand in the corner of your screen so we could all know that you're part of the NIA team. Um, that would be really helpful for all our participants because they might have a question that's specific for you. Um, and it'd be great to connect those questions to you. Okay, that's too much talking from me. <laughs> um, I would like to um, let you know that there was a really interesting conversation that happened um, with an astronaut. And I wanna invite Kayla to talk a little bit about that. Is, are you okay with that, Kayla? Is this... Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. So, sorry. Um, so, we were able to talk with Ellen Ochoa, and she was the first Hispanic woman to go to space. Um, she went on the nine-day mission aboard the space shuttle Discovery. And, um, yeah, she was the first female Hispanic director and the second female director of the Johnson Space Center. And we were able to talk with her through email. Um, so yeah, she plays the flute and she's incredibly talented. So she plays the flute, she went to space and she was the first Hispanic woman to do that. So we asked her what memory stands out most from your time in space. And she said, it's difficult to pick out just one. Perhaps for my last mission, I remember looking back at the space station after we, the crew of the space shuttle, unlocked and moved 400 feet away. The ISS was difficult to see because we were on the night side of Earth. Then sunrise happened very quickly and it lit up in almost an instant. We had brought up and installed the first piece of the trust structure, which would be built over the next several years and allow labs from other countries to be attached and powered. So it was a very satisfying feeling to have contributed to that as well as a beautiful view. And that picture, it's so... <laughs> It's so pretty. Um, yeah, so that was a that was a really interesting experience to like 
hear about what she was able to photograph. And I think we all kind of wish to be on that space shuttle. <laughs> um, we also asked her what motivated you to achieve your dreams and ambitions. And she said, I wanted to participate in something bigger than myself that would benefit people on earth. Human spaceflight is such an endeavor and the start of the space shuttle program in 1981, it became also a laboratory in space where experiments could be carried out that couldn't be done on earth. So, yep. <laughs> um, so I'm also Dominican. So this is more about like Hispanic woman going into space. Um, so we asked her, what barriers did you overcome to become the first Hispanic woman astronaut? She said, I certainly came across people who discouraged me because they didn't fit their view of what a scientist or engineer looked like. These people didn't know me at all or what I could offer. Fortunately, I always had other people, family, friends, professors, colleagues, supervisors, who did know me and encouraged and supported me. Those are the people who you should look for and listen to. So basically, if, if people are telling you that you can't do something, you, you should have support behind you so you can get there. <laughs> um, we also asked her, looking back, what would you whisper to your 15 year old self? And she said, there are going to be many opportunities for you than there are today. So continue to work hard, persevere and reach for the stars. I think that was the last question. Beautiful, so beautiful. Um, you know, Kayla, this is such a perfect example of the type of learning that will happen at NIA, right? Where students, students and adults, we're all learners, right? We have questions and we ask our questions to experts. Um, we make connections with people um, because we understand that um, other people are the sources of learning, right? So. Um, whether it's making a connection to an astronaut the way you did or the common person walking down the street that we need to know more about because we want to um, somehow make an experience better for them. All of this is a uh, part of human-centered design, which is what we're all about. And certainly as a community, right? We want to always learn more about each other and our experiences and what each of us knows um, so that we can be better community members for each other. That was such a great example. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. No problem. All right. Um, so, oh yes, very important announcement. <laughs> Find your pin at Mia. now enrolling grades six through 12. And then there's the website. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, can we see the screen with everyone's faces again? Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, so um, let me take a quick look at um, the chat here to make sure. Oh, mm -hmm. there is a question here. Um, how do you express the importance of science to the public? Um, Sophie, do you mind taking that question? And I'm going to continue looking here. Um, yeah, sure. There's one more question for Kayla. So we'll hear from Sophie. I'll ask the question to Kayla. And then if there are any closing remarks um, from the NIA faculty, that would be great. Okay. Um, so how do you express the importance of science to the public? So Oh, that's a good question. There's actually like a whole branch of astronomy that goes into communicating uh, astronomical ideas and discoveries to the public because the public is very vital in astronomy and getting funding for NASA and NSF and all that. Um, uh, I would say, I mean, we all have like reach, reach uh, what is it, Read, uh, reach out groups that we can do like for whatever community we're in. So like I did do an event with the NC, North Carolina Museum of Science for like uh, aspiring students for astrophysics. Um, but to express the importance of science to like, I guess the general audience, um, I think it's very, I mean, I think it's relatively easy. You just have to tap into some 
experience that everyone has felt at one point or another, like looking up at the stars or like being by the ocean or just, you know, understanding like the vastness of, you know, our world and our universe. Um, so I would say like pulling at memories or personal experiences and then relating that to science is always a great idea of how, how to do that. Um, as well as, you know, eye candy, <laughs> a whole thing, a whole reason of like astronomy or a whole part of astronomy is just making pretty plots um, and making a beautiful pictures of stars. That's kind of why we still use Hubble. Hubble is great for a lot of things. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope, of course. Of course. Um, but, you know, at this point, it's kind of just taking pretty pictures. And they have a whole team of scientists that basically reduce these images to make like the most beautiful pictures that, you know, the whole public sees. Um, and that's just eye candy. That's just for the public to see the beautiful image of space and to give us more money so we can keep researching. Um, and so, you know, doing little things like that and just intriguing interest. Um, I think that's how you communicate the idea. But, but like just visual, you know, visual imagery is always a great. So I think that's Hubble was launched in 2018, right? No, Hubble was, uh, when was Hubble launched? It was launched a while ago. I'd, Kayla, Kayla, do you know it's like 70s-ish, 80s? I no idea. <laughs> repair trips. Let's see. I don't know. Find out. Oh, um, oh sorry. Here's one, here's one, a uh, last one um, for Kayla. Um, what did you learn from this experience, reaching out um, for your dream role model, reaching out to your dream role model? So I think I definitely learned that I can ask anyone questions and they're like more than happy to respond. So I'm like much more confident now in like going forward and emailing people or I don't know, scheduling a Zoom call or asking to like meet somewhere. <laughs> You know, it's like, I never thought that you could just like have a conversation with an astronaut through email. Like that's just seemed like so crazy. So I think, yeah, I think being able to be accessible like that, it was very interesting. <laughs> and then also I learned that um, she was the first Hispanic woman astronaut. Like I never knew that. And being able to talk to someone that like, I wish I could be like, like she's like, my role model, like everything I want to be. <laughs> um, that was like, she, she was able to tell me what other people did that I can do. And like other, what other people told her that I'll have to face eventually and how she overcame that. So it was very, very interesting. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kayla. Um, Elise, Elise Mott, you had your hand up earlier. Was there a question or comment you wanted to share? I just was um, curious that Sophie's artwork was so amazing. And I just wondered about the abstracts and what was sort of like the founding um, idea for some of those. They're really amazing. Um, so let's see. Well, I go through uh, in undergrad, you know, you're constantly like evolving in your painting. Um, so I'm trying to like it's kind of this funny misconception that it's like since I study astronomy like I paint the stars it's not how painting works uh, you know <laughs> you're painting what you're for me it's like I'm painting what I'm feeling or what you know I'm trying to communicate to the audience and in this case it was like emotions or um through like abstract painting and so that obviously changes for me with time a lot of the paintings that I did like senior year were very like time sensitive um so it was like, I was creating pieces that were like the mood or emotions that I was feeling that very second. Um, and so a lot of it, I would say is a little bit more like raw and it isn't very processed. And I didn't think a whole lot about it um, versus like, you know, like one of my other studio mates was like painting extremely realistic painting uh, portraits of, you know, of himself and other people. Um, so it was, it was very much like quick moving abstract paintings that are like trend, like trying to just transcribe, uh, any emotions that I was feeling. And so I like using that with color, um, and materials. And I like, so one of the big one, the really red one was like, 
I really loved red. I had been painting in blue for so long and I was like, why am I playing, painting in blue? Blue is so calm. I'm not calm. <laughs> it was like in the middle of like midterms and stuff. I'm like, I'm not calm at all. <laughs> I'm so stressed out. So I was like, what's great? Red. <laughs> so I'm going through like all these paints of red, different versions of red. Um, and oil pastels are great, but yeah. So that's kind of like the general gist of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, it is time for us to close. I'm so sorry. I know there were so many more things to be said. Um, I'd like to invite Jean. Um, Jean um, Jones is one of our founding trustee members. Um, I'd like to invite her to close us out this evening. So much gratitude and appreciation um, for everyone that's been here tonight. Thank you. And Jean, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, well, I would like to uh, thank you very much, Ayla. I'd like to uh, thank all of you who came tonight and listened. I have been looking forward to this presentation for a very long time. And uh, in fact, as soon when it was still in its conceptual phases, I thought this is gonna be so wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie, and to Kayla and to Ayla for a really interesting evening. And uh, I found <clears throat> your comments, uh, Kayla and Sophie, to be so inspiring. And uh, if we can uh, have a few more girls who are interested in careers and sciences with all of your inspirational comments today, I think that'll be a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, we need more women in, in all fields, but especially in the sciences. So thank you so much. And I appreciate it terrifically. And uh, we look forward to our, our, our next event like this. I hope this isn't the last one. I hope it's just the beginning of a series. Yes. Thank you all, everyone. We wish you a very good night. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.